So I'll start off and I'm going to try to present some of the physiology behind some of this and how the arguments are sort of coming together that there is some realism to this concept of window. I have nothing to declare for this presentation. So for a long time, going back to the Framingham data, we've known that regardless of the age of menopause, if you're premenopausal, you're somewhat protected. So having endogenous estrogen is a protection against cardiovascular disease. And by the same concept, if it's longer, so women who have late reproductive life are also protected from cardiovascular disease. So endogenous estrogens are very important. And this, the opposite is also true. So this is a recent meta-analysis showing that if you have onset of menopause, natural menopause, before age 45, and of course there, there have been earlier data on oophorectomy, then for, certainly for coronary disease, you have an increased risk. So lack of estrogen and its longevity uh, are risk factors. And this speaks to mechanisms of protection uh, whereas there are multiple, multiple mechanisms, most of the work, if you will, seems to be at the level of the vessel wall, genomic and non-genomic mechanisms of cardioprotection. And we've known for years now, going back to several important meta-analyses in the late 80s, early 90s, this is one I pulled from Mayor Stamfer from the nurses cohort, showing a protection of menopausal use of estrogen of, in the range of about 50%. Uh, protection of women who are started early on estrogen. And so important, this comes from the Leisure World cohort in Southern California, so important is this concept is if you look at the case fatality of all the things that estrogen can, can do, like prevent osteoporotic fractures, perhaps increase some of the risk in breast cancer, the case fatality rate is strongest, is highest for ischemic heart disease than anything else. So that impact becomes massive in terms of the math behind all of this, which then led to this, this meta-analysis and recommendations from Deborah Grady uh, for the American College of Physicians. This goes way back. And these are meta-analytic data of the use of 0.625 milligrams of conjugated coronary estrogens, which was the prevalent prevalent use in those days, that looking at a relatively conservative, protective effect on coronary disease of 0.65, in other words, 35% protection, that would amount to one to two years of life savings. So at the time, and this goes back to 91, 92, the ACP recommendations was that estrogen could be used for prevention because it had this tremendous impact on mortality by attenuating coronary disease and coronary death. Then came the trials, and as you all know, this is sort of historic. The first trials were secondary prevention trials. Uh, we thought, everybody thought, if it did prevent heart disease, you'd get a very early, much earlier signal or, or result by looking at women with established disease. And in fact, that was a big bugaboo in all of this, is that if you look at women with established disease, particularly in the mid to late 60s, you not only did not have a significant effect, but EH stands for early harm. You would induce early harm in these women. And that was clearly was witnessed, as was hers. This is the Hully study, where in the early going, these 67-year-old women started for the first time on 0.65, 2.5, had more cardiovascular events. Then there was a little bit of a regression downwards, but it was the, the damage was done, if you will. Also, in WHI, you remember it's an expansive age group that went all the way up to 79. There was some, this was borderline statistically significant, but of the entire group, there was, there was a signal for early harm as well, and it was largely accounted for by the older age group. And of course, the explanation of this discrepancy is that younger women were treated in the observational studies, such as the Women's Health Initiative, I'm sorry, the Nurses' Health uh, Study, as opposed to WHI, where women were treated for hot flushes and were generally healthy, as opposed to women who are of mean age 63, and almost by definition, some of them have had established disease. So, the contrast between observational data and RCT, you know, I'm of the thinking that a good study is a good study, and you can't just throw out all observational data. 
But there is a lot of consistency between the um, WHI and the randomized trials and observational data. There is a decrease in osteoporosis, some small increase in stroke, which can be argued back and forth, uh, increase in uterine cancer if it's unopposed, small increase in breast cancer, decrease in colon cancer, increase in thrombosis with oral therapy. But not consistent between observational data and, and randomized trials is coronary disease and dementia risk. We won't have time to talk about dementia risk, but this leads to this timing hypothesis. Is there a window of opportunity in looking at women who are younger and healthy at the onset? And my guru in this whole area is Tom Clarkson, the late Tom Clarkson of great fame. He was the first to model this in the Cinemologus monkey and showed, as well, you well know, that if you oophorectomize a monkey and start the monkey immediately on estrogen, sort of very early intervention, in spite of an atherogenic diet, you had a reduction in plaque size. There was less coronary plaque. But if you delayed it for a period of time, and this goes in monkey years to hu the human equivalent of six or seven years, starting estrogen later, it was too late. There was no effect. And so if we put the clinical trials into perspective, HERS, and even HWHI were late starters in this general equation, as opposed to the observational study as suggested by the nurse's health study. And so the mechanism is that the biology of plaque is that it builds up over time, and you lose your protective mechanisms, which were witnessed in observational trials, and actually can induce harm later on. The lesion extent, the amount, this is back to the monkey model, the amount of burden influences the response. You do not get a response in reducing plaque size dependent on the amount of coronary burden you have. And so a vessel like this at the onset of menopause could be protective, could, you could see protective effects of estrogen, and you not only tend to see it, not see it in, in complicated plaque, but there is the possibility of harm, as was witnessed clinically. At the, when you have atherotic plaque, you have a lot of activity, metamorphosis and gelatinetic activity in the mural aspects of the, of the coronary vessel that can break down. So one of the universal things of oral estrogen, not transdermal, is that oral estrogen will induce MMPs, matrix metamorphosis, and these will chew away at the mural part of the pla plaque. So, you know, if you have no plaque, there's no substrate, you have no breakup. But if you have plaque, these MMPs induced will, will cause instability of, of plaque rupture and then thrombosis. So this is the mechanism, protective, and as you get worse and worse plaque, not only can you induce early harm, but you've lost the protective effects. And the protective effects are multiple mechanisms, but as you get more and more plaque, you have methylation of the estrogen receptor, and so estrogen can't act. There's also elaboration of 17-hydroxyprogesterone that acts as a serum at the level of the endothelium, blocking the estrogen receptor from working. So these are the mechanisms. This is the elaboration of 17-hydroxyprogesterone that acts as a sperm, blocking ER-alpha at the, at the vessel wall. So Estrogen doesn't work in a plaque-laden vessel, but you can also induce harm, as I've shown earlier. In WHI, a good proportion, 25, 75% or more, had complicated lesions, just by the biology of what normally happens with the age of atherosclerosis. Whereas, you know, about 20% were healthy. And so very early on, Jacques Rousseau and the group showed as early as 2007 that in the younger age group, 50 to 59, and this is the WHI cohort, where only 2,000, 2,500 were in that younger age group, there was a 30% reduction in total mortality, which was consistent with the observational data, but just looking at that younger cohort. And so there was a, there was a statistically significant trend analysis with estrogen alone for coronary disease by age. And C. et al. showed this composite benefit. If you just look at the 50 to 59-year-old age group, estrogen alone, there was a significant benefit of a composite um, uh, endpoint. 
Our own data, we were interested in this early harm phenomenon, and so we looked at 4,000 odd women in clinical trials observed using estrogen, conjugated equine estrogens for two years. We, we found in the first two years in, in these 4,000 women, which was bigger than the WHI cohort of 50 to 59 year old age group women, we saw no cardiac events, zero over this period of time. And remember, this is double the population as was witnessed in WHI in this uh, age group of 50 to 59. Then we have data from Europe. This is the DOPS trial. Now, this was um, a prospective, randomized trial, but not with placebo. This was against nothing. But these 1,000 women were followed for 16 years. And so there were not, no, not only no early events, but there was a statistical significant reduction looking at a composite um, endpoint of mortality, hospitalizations for congestive failure or MI after 11 years, followed out to 16 years. So younger women do benefit, and in DOPS, the younger the women, the more they benefited, making the argument towards a timing type of hypothesis. Now, the only true prospective testing of the, of the window hypothesis is the ELITE trial from Howard Hodes at USC. He studied early women within six years of menopause and those after six years. Oral estrogen, one milligram, five years of exposure using vaginal progesterone to minimize any attenuation. Primary endpoint is the carotid IMT, which is a good surrogate of the buildup of atherosclerosis. And indeed, the timing hypothesis was proven. This is the, so IMT goes up as a function of age. This group here is published in the England Journal against placebo. There was really no change in the active one milligram group, and the placebo group went up, okay? Now, in Howard's study, the elite trial, unfortunately, they couldn't show any changes in coronary calcium, maybe because of relations of time, and I think this is important because we think coronary calcium is important, and this was shown in WHI. John Manson showed that in women who were on the estrogen alone uh, followed in time, there was less coronary calcium scores above 100, highly statistically significant with the estrogen alone group. So the data are very consistent. This is a Salpeter meta-analysis of younger women, just events, coronary events, including WHI, showing a protective effect of about 30%. And her meta-analysis, Bayesian meta-analysis, forward and backward looking, looking at randomized trials and as well as observational data, showing again a, a composite um, relative risk of hazards ratio of 0.7, 30% protection. Data are very, very consistent. Along with the Cochrane um, analysis, looking at coronary morbidity and mortality, specifically women within 10 years of menopause had a relative risk of 0.5, very consistent. And the Finnish study from Tommy McCullough, the point I wanna make here was that he showed, although these are observational data, that it related to duration of use. So the longer the use, the more protection. The other thing I like about this slide is it's not just conjugated equine estrogens. They used estradiol products. And even with estradiol and progesterone in the Finnish cohort, there was protection. So overall, with 10 years of use, there were 19 fewer coronary deaths and seven fewer strokes per 1,000 women in this cohort. So the data are extremely, extremely consistent. This is back to WHI. If we look at the coronary, these were statistically significant reductions in this young age group, 50 to 59 year old group with estrogen um, in, in WHI, followed out to 13 years. And the most recently published 18 year follow up by Andrew Johan Manson was not very different. The observational trials uh, still showed this effect but there was a sort of a regression to the mean. It sort of faded a little bit as time went on. So consistency through all trials that I've shown you, reductions in, in uh, mortality. Um, this pertains to timing, pertains to other things. One of the interesting things is, is glucose metabolism. So, you know, estrogen decreases the risk of di new onset diabetes. Diabetes risk increases the function of age. And this trial, which was very short, there was one week of transdermal estrogen. It showed using a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp that the glucose disposal rate was affected. In other words, insulin action, you could reduce the, the glucose disposal rate 
if you used estrogen early, but not if you used estrogen late. And finally, stroke. Stroke is a very complicated issue, but this was an interesting study published uh, earlier this year, or late last year, that early initiation tend to uh, decrease the, uh, sorry, increase the years free of stroke, right? And so conclusions are that compared to never use, hormone use in these five cohorts initiated within five years was associated with a decreased risk of stroke, whereas late initiation increased the risk. And so similarly, this is the sort of survival curve. This is stroke time-free period, and this is the early initiation. So within five years of menopause, regardless of the regimen or duration, was associated with reduced or null risk in stroke. So this is my last slide. This is a conclusion. Early age of initiation of hormonal therapy after menopause is beneficial for the cardiovascular system and has benefits for metabolism as well. Pertinent data on early age of initiation show a beneficial effect on coronary disease and mortality, glucose metabolism, and stroke risk. Other areas, such as Alzheimer's, are beyond the scope of today's presentations. Late initiation, however, may be detrimental on most parameters. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm thrilled to be here. This work is funded by the National Institutes of Health, and here are my disclosures. So cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death worldwide among both men and women. And as we just so elegantly heard, women don't tend to develop cardiovascular disease until they are postmenopausal. And in the case of certain forms of cardiovascular disease, such as coronary heart disease, um, quite a bit later than among men. So the menopause transition is this time right before the onset of cardiovascular events and oftentimes seen as a time of accelerating cardiovascular risk. Although it's been debated the degree to which ovarian or chronologic aging contributes to cardiovascular disease in women. So here are some data from the study of women's health across the nation. This is a longitudinal cohort study. And we had serial measurements on carotid IMT. This is one of our subclinical cardiovascular disease measures. And what we see is that as women cycle through these stages of the menopause, when they hit the late perimenopause, you start to see an acceleration in the accumulation of carotid IMT. We didn't have a lot of women out here in the postmenopause yet, so I'm not going to say anything about them. But it does support the notion that um, the menopause over and above chronologic aging alone um, is important for women's cardiovascular health. So I'll give you um, the bottom line right now in terms of what we see with respect to endogenous hormones in SWAN. The endogenous hormones do not fully explain this effect. So what do we see? Obviously, the menopause is accompanied by our characteristic menstrual changes, hormonal changes, but also symptoms such as vasomotor symptoms and sleep problems that may have implications for women's health. So let's talk about vasomotor symptoms. So hot flushes and night sweats, these sensations of intense heat accompanied by sweating and flushing, most women, upwards of 70%, get these things. For a third of women, they are very frequent or severe. We used to think they lasted about three to five years around the final menstrual period, but now we know they probably last more like a decade. And this has been replicated in three different cohorts, both in the US and internationally. And in fact, not all women follow the same patterns of vasomotor symptoms. So these are longitudinal data, again, from SWAN. Um, and we're anchoring these vasomotor symptoms to the final menstrual period. And what we find is that women tend to follow one of four groups. We have these women in the orange who primarily have their vasomotor symptoms before they've even stop, stopped menstruating. We have these women in the green who have their vasomotor symptoms primarily postmenopausally. We have the women in the blue that are the lucky few women who have few or no vasomotor symptoms. And then we have these women in the red, and we call these women the super flashers because they start their flashes early and they just keep going. So we do see this variability in the patterns that women follow. Now we know that vasomotor symptoms are important for women's quality of life, sleep, mood, overall functioning, 
But what about their physical health? And in fact, it was some data from the Women's Health Initiative and the HERS study, our big hormone therapy trials, that started to indicate there might be something different about these women with vasomotor symptoms. So we began to ask, what are the vasomotor symptoms? Do they have any relationship to women's vascular health? Um, and of course, we need to consider our sex steroid hormones when we're considering the associations. Okay, so I've mentioned SWAN a few times. Let me tell you a little bit more about this cohort. This is a study of over 3,000 women that was recruited in the United States at seven different study sites and five different racial ethnic groups. Everybody was pre or early perimenopausal at entry. Nobody was taking hormones at entry. And we've followed these women. Now we're in our 15th year of follow-up. And we've for pretty much annually assessed a whole range of different factors, including physical measures, blood markers, and symptoms. And we began by asking whether vasomotor symptoms, these women with vasomotor symptoms, had more adverse cardiovascular risk profile. And indeed, we see vasomotor symptoms associated with higher blood pressure, incident um, hypertension, higher ApoB, uh, LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, a greater insulin resistant profile, and a more procoagulant profile as defined by factor 7C and TPA antigen. And this is adjusted for things like age, um, as well as BMI, and all the other risk factors that we're interested in. Some other cohorts have found these associations as well, but what's unique about SWAN is the longitudinal nature of these data, so we just had that much more power over time. Now, what we were really interested in was, was some measures of subclinical cardiovascular disease, and I'll go into these measures in a couple minutes here. Um, so we had a sub-study in SWAN where we, we imaged women's vasculatures, and then the findings were so interesting, we added these carotid um, atherosclerosis measures onto the core SWAN cohort later on. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about these measures. Um, so flow media dilation is a non-invasive measure of the endothelium, which is that single cell layer lining the vessel, very important to vascular tone and health. One of the first things to go in the atherosclerotic process. Um, and as we just heard about, carotid IMT, this is measuring the thickness of the intimal and medial layers of the carotid artery. This is a surrogate measure for atherosclerosis. You can also measure carotid plaque via ultrasound this way. And this is a pretty well-validated measure of um, a surrogate for atherosclerosis. And the reason why the, we use these measures in midlife women is very few midlife women actually have clinical disease. So we need to use these subclinical measures. And these are some early data that we published in 2008 showing that women with hot flushes had significantly lower FMD than women without hot flushes. Um, and this is controlling for our cardiovascular risk factors, BMI, um, estradiol, race ethnicity, et cetera. And later on, a couple years later, we showed associations between these vasomotor symptom frequencies. So the more frequent the vasomotor symptoms, the higher the IMT. And again, you can adjust for many of your standard risk factors, and it really did not change these associations. We are not the only ones who show these associations. Here are some other data showing um, an increased frequency of vasomotor symptoms associated with higher IMT. Now, not all cohorts show this, and um, the cohorts that don't tend to show this tend to be the very healthy, lean women. So in SWAN, we have a, a pretty big range in terms of the underlying risk profile. So we tend to see it more in SWAN. However, there's limitations to these studies. These are post hoc analyses of studies really not designed to address this question. The hormone measures, the endogenous hormone measures, are good. They were state of the art for the time, but we know we can do better. And we have much more sensitive measures that get at these low levels, particularly of estradiol, in postmenopausal women. Our questionnaire measures of vasomotor symptoms okay for epidemiologic studies, but it's really hard for people to remember these kind of symptoms with any kind of precision. So we can do better. We can use physiologic measures of vasomotor symptoms as well as prospective self-report. And if we really want to get at this question of whether vasomotor symptoms really are associated with vascular risk, we have to use our strong measures of vasomotor symptoms that we have. And we need to measure sex steroid hormones well and really do a good job with cardiovascular risk factors to make sure this isn't really a confounding association.
So we did that. We recruited a separate cohort of 300 women in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, between the ages of 40 and 60, and free of clinical cardiovascular disease. We brought them into the lab, we um, screened them, did some physical measures, hooked them up to these ambulatory hot flash monitors. We're also getting 24-hour EKG. Um, here's a picture of what the hot flash looks like. We gave them an electronic diary to fill out every time they had a hot flash prospectively, so we don't need people to try to remember. We brought them back in, had the fasting blood draw for some of our other cardiovascular risk factors, um, mass spec measured uh, hormones, and had preacal and carotid ultrasounds as well. Okay, so what did we find? So here we have on the x-axis quartiles of vasomotor symptoms. The red are the physiologically measured vasomotor symptoms. The blue is self-report on the y-axis is IMT. Among these women who reported having vasomotor symptoms, the more they had, the higher their IMT. And it didn't matter whether they're physiologically measured hot flashes or a prospective diary reported hot flashes as well. So we see this sort of dose response. We adjusted for everything we could possibly think of and could not explain this away. And in fact, here's the variance in IMT explained by all of our various risk factors. This is all our measures in the model um, together. And our physiologically monitored vasomotor symptoms accounted for about 8% of the variance in IMT, more than any other variable in the model, um, with the ex exception of race ethnicity. And I should mention, these women are in their early to mid-50s. We also said, uh, showed more frequent vasomotor symptoms associated with higher carotid plaque. So about half of these women, surprisingly to us, showed carotid plaque. We did not expect that um, among these early to mid-50 women, all of whom were free of clinical cardiovascular disease and who were basically non-diabetic, um, non-insulin dependent. So we saw this and we were surprised as well. Okay, so what could possibly explain this? So obviously we need to look at our hormones. The bottom line is that we did this like incredible job measuring these sex steroid hormones, spent gobs of money, and it really did not explain these associations. Now these are data um, that are just coming out really like last month in JCEM. And this is just showing the association between these hormones and our different vascular outcomes. And the bottom line is that for mass spec measured estradiol and testosterone, we did not see anything for FMD, IMT, or plaque. Um, estrone, in fact, showed a slight effect um, improvement in um, endothelial function and really complicated relationships for SHBG and free testosterone depending on the vascular bed under study. But the bottom line is this did not explain what we saw. And we tried, we really tried. Um, we did a bunch of different inflammatory markers and clotting factors, CRP, IL-6, um, a bunch, D-dimer, really did not explain things. Obviously, we did a deep dive into cardiovascular risk factors, lipid, lipid particle sizes, nothing there. We measure 24-hour EKG that gets us at the autonomic nervous system. This is really the balance of the sympathetic and parasympathetic control of heart rate. And what we found here, we're looking at acute changes in heart rate variability right around that hot flash. And we were able to do this because we had physically monitored hot flashes over the course of 24 hours. So we lined up these data. And what we see is acute reductions in cardiac vagal control. So autonomic vagal control over the heart rate. Um, and um, this was pretty pronounced. We've now replicated this three times. And this is probably more important to understanding the physiology of hot flashes, however, than these relationships with things like IMT. Because when we adjusted for heart rate variability, it did nothing to those associations between vasomotor symptoms and IMT. Okay, so we still have more work to do. We don't understand the mechanism yet, so stay tuned. But what we found is that timing matters, and this was really surprising. So we just heard about the importance of timing. When it came to FMD, what we found is it was the women who were the younger tertile of women in the sample that, who had poor, lower here is worse, poor I, um, endothelial function with more frequent vasomotor symptoms, and their, um, their, their, vasomo their, excuse me, their endothelial function among these younger women looked like their older counterparts um, when they had more vasomotor symptoms. So we thought this was maybe a chance or a fluke finding. Um, but we also looked in the WISE cohort. This is a cohort of uh, women that was established by Noel Barry-Mers, a very famous cohort, 
And what we found was that these women who recalled having their vasomotor symptoms, starting their vasomotor symptoms very early in the menopause transition, age 42 or earlier, these were the women ha who had lower FMD, poor endothelial function. Um, and this was not explained by smoking or age at menopause or oophorectomy. These women in the WISE cohort also with early onset vasomotor symptoms had greater cardiovascular disease mortality. Okay. So if you don't believe it yet, we also toggled back to the SWAN cohort. Remember these trajectories? So we link these trajectories of vasomotor symptoms to IMT later on in the postmenopause. And we really expected these super flashers in the red were going to be the ones who had the worst IMT. And in unadjusted analyses, indeed, these women in the red, these super flashers, had somewhat higher IMT, but it was really these women who had their vasomotor symptoms who were relatively early in the menopause transition. And when we adjusted for covariates, the high group dropped out, so things like race, ethnicity, BMI, blood pressure, um, and those early onset women remained. Now, why this is the case, again, we don't know yet. But it's, I think we've now seen this in three separate cohorts, so it's worthy of our attention. All right, so there's more to menopausal symptoms than vasomotor symptoms. Women are also having a lot of sleep problems during the menopause transition. And in fact, we see these sleep problems, these are SWAN data, increasing over the course of the menopause transition beyond <coughs> aging alone. And we know from our population-based data that short or poor sleep has been associated with elevated cardiovascular disease risk, not necessarily during the menopause, but at other times of life. In fact, short sleep is associated with 50% increase in coronary heart disease mortality, and that is a major meta-analysis. Women have poor sleep during the menopause, as well as um, this potentially accelerating vascular risk. What are the implications of this oftentimes persistently disrupted sleep? And we need to think about this in the, in the, um, in together with vasomotor symptoms as well. So we looked at this question in um, Ms. Hart. This is our local cohort. And we looked at a range of different potential explanatory factors, including vasomotor symptoms. So we're, we're looking at these 300 women again. And I just want to underscore that we had objective um, actigraphy measurements of sleep. So we're not having women self-report. We're measuring their sleep. And what we found here on the x-axis is, is sleep time, and on the y-axis is carotid plaque. And what we found is women with shorter sleep, so five or few hours of sleep a night, these women had elevated carotid plaque. Um, and in fact, these women thought that they were sleeping six hours. Okay, So when a patient tells you it's six hours, it's probably more like five. And we could not explain this away, and this was not due to apnea, which is a major issue to consider for women's vascular health during the menopause transition. Uh, we also saw, this is Sarah Nowakowski, a trainee of mine, who found that poor sleep efficiency, so they're waking up a lot during the night, these women have a more pro-inflammatory phenotype, such as IL-6 and von Willebrand factor antigen, which is also an endothelial marker. Now, vasomotor symptoms did not explain these associations between sleep and vascular risk, but there was a little bit of a hint of a potential synergy. So if you had short sleep and above the median number of vasomotor symptoms overnight, physiologically monitored vasomotor symptoms, there was some evidence you would have some higher IMT. So I, vasomotor symptoms don't account for the relationship between sleep and cardiovascular risk, but there may be a synergy here. Okay, so we looked at vasomotor symptoms, we've looked at sleep problems, what are we doing next? Well, we have a lot more answers, uh, questions than answers, I think, but now we're looking at the brain. So we found some information showing that women in our data, that they had, the women with more sleep vasomotor symptoms have more white matter hyperintensities in the brain. This is a marker of small vessel disease in the brain. So we're bringing that Ms. Hart cohort back. That was a pilot study of 20 women here. And we're doing it on the full two, uh, 230 of those Ms. Hart women, repeating that whole vascular profile um, uh, protocol, measuring cognition as well as brain imaging. So stay tuned. We should have our data in a couple years. OK. So vasomotor symptoms, they uh, start earlier, last longer than we thought. They may mark something different about the underlying vasculature of these women, particularly when they have very early onset.
However, the sleep problems are also relevant. Women with short or very disrupted sleep, particularly in the context of vasomotor symptoms, these are women we need to pay attention to. And we really have to get um, some aggressive risk factor reduction on board at midlife. We know we are not as good at predicting what midlife women go on to have events, simply because there's a longer time period than for men between midlife and events. Um, so any midlife indicators we have are helpful. So we obviously need to understand the mechanisms that are linking vasomotor symptoms and vascular risk. Um, and any, any of these timing effects we need to understand more. We need more data on clinical events. And I just want to make a shout out to a recent paper that have shown relationships between vasomotor symptoms and incident coronary heart disease, a twofold increase. Um, but we need more data with longitudinally assessed vasomotor symptoms and really um, well-verified clinical events, medical record verified, et cetera. And we hope to be doing that in Swan soon as our women age into their 70s and beyond. And of course, the $10 million question is whether treating the vasomotor symptoms or improving the sleep problems has any impact on women's vascular health. We do not know. And of course, all of this is with the goal of improving women's health. Okay, thank you. These are my collaborators on this work. I want to thank you guys for staying for my uh, presentation. So um, today my talk is on the interrelationships between blood vessel function, cognition, and fracture risk. So here are my disclosures. So dementia and osteoporosis affect women more so than men. And in Australia, dementia is the biggest killer of older women. So obviously, there's a clear sex difference in the incidence of late uh, onset dementia, particularly after the age of 85 years old, where we see a doubling in the rates uh, in women. And the trend in sex difference is similar uh, for osteoporosis, where the prevalence increases markedly after the age of 50 years old. So while coronary heart disease is the biggest killer uh, of men and women, I'll put forth to you that the initiation and the progression of dementia and osteoporosis are also contributed by circulatory dysfunction. So we all know that estrogen uh, protects uh, multiple body functions, including the brain, our heart, reproductive uh, systems, as well as bone and muscle. And women are more likely to get osteoporosis because we have low peak uh, bone density to begin with. Um, and when menopause hits, we get an accelerated bone loss at about 1% to 2% per year. And this is double the, age, uh, the rate of the age-related bone loss. So um, the... Um, estrogen, as we all know, has um, you know cardioprotective uh, effects, um, which explains um, you know the cardiovascular protection it offers premenopausal women. So briefly, it, estrogen binds to the receptors on the endothelium cells that trigger a cascade of events that, that leads to vasodilatation, and this is essential that we get uh, adequate uh, perfusion to the tissues. So with aging, we don't just get a reduction uh, in uh, est um, estrogen levels. Many of these pathways are also downregulated. So the net effect we get is stiffening of the arterial walls, and also that leads to a reduced tissue perfusion. And the importance of perfusion in the brain cannot be uh, underestimated here because when we get a um, mild hyperperfusion in the brain, at the early stages, it just affects our learning and our memory. But the more progressive reduction in blood flow then leads to more severe hypoxia then can that can cause an array of detrimental effects, including your amyloid beta and your hyperphosphorated tau uh, accumulation. So this uh, mild hyperperfusion can go on for many, many years before we can actually detect any objective changes in our cognition. And by then, the damage may have become irreversible. But we, what we can do early on is to be able to assess um, early changes in cerebral vasodilator function, and we can do so non-invasively using transcranial Doppler ultrasound and using a hypercapnic challenge protocol that is designed to induce uh, dilatation of the cerebral vessels. It's like a stress test for the brain. So as soon as the carbogen gas is being inhaled, we see a rise in blood flow velocity in the middle cerebral artery, and the greater the increase, the better the vessel's capacity to dilate. We can also assess uh, intracranial vessel stiffness by looking at the ratio of the difference between systolic and diastolic flow velocity and the mean flow velocity. And the higher uh, the, the pulsatility index, the stiffer the vessel is. 
There are associations between poor uh, blood flow and the severity of cognitive impairment, but these observations are done in late stage dementia where the, the damage have become irreversible. And there are currently no prospective studies tracking the changes in neurovascular um, that would predict um, cognitive impairment. So we asked the question as to whether or not we can detect any early vascular deficits in cognitively normal, healthy um, older adults. So using baseline data collected from one of our clinical trials, uh, we cross-sectionally evaluated the associations between cerebral vascular function and cognition in post healthy postmenopausal women. We assessed the following cognitive domains, um, all of which are implicated in aging. And what we found was um, that poor cognitive performance um, was directly related to uh, intracranial vessel stiffness, poor uh, vasodilatation in the brain, as well as in the breakdown of the neurovascular coupling unit. So another area that's often overlooked, uh, particularly in the skeletal uh, research field, is the contribution of vascular resistance uh, for bone health uh, and bone metabolism. So uh, our bones receive about 10% of cardiac output, and this is important for exchange of oxygen, nutrients, and waste products. So impaired in perfusion can reduce, um, can lead to bone loss and necrosis. So when oxygen levels are low, our osteoblast functions become inactive, but our osteoclast activity continues that results in increased bone resorption. And estrogen mainly inhibits the bone resorption here. And studies have shown that there's positive relationship between the lumbar spine bone mineral density uh, and brachial artery FMD. And so far, we know that there are a range of factors that can accelerate the progression of vascular impairment that leads to arterial stiffness and impaired tissue perfusion. And in the brain, this can affect our cognition, in our systemic circulation, our bone health can be compromised. The increase in osteoporosis prevalence parallels the increase in dementia, as shown in observation study. So while there are no apparent pathological overlap between the two, so there are a couple of proposed uh, potential links, such as low vitamin status and inflammation. But another plausible reason for this association could be that cognitive impairment can increase the risk of falls and falls-related fracture. So data from Australia shows that 90% of our hospitalization in older adults with dementia as a result of a fall, 50% uh, of them suffer a fracture, and the main causes are falling on the same level or tripping over steps and furniture. So obviously there's an interplay between our cognitive function and falls. And if you think about it, we do need multiple cognitive domains to, you know, to execute a particular movement. So an example is when a telephone rings, we need to link the ringtone to the telephone, remember where your phone is, plan how we're going to get there, avoid the obstacles along the way, decide on the walking speed, and all at the same time wondering who is calling you so late in the night. <laughs> so, um, it, it, so if you think about it, somebody with cognitive impairment, the chances of tripping and falling are quite likely. And if osteoporosis is there, the chances of a trauma fracture are also quite high. So um, it's important to know that these associations are found in population groups with high disease severity. So, um, and the links between vascular dysfunction, low bone mineral density, cognitive decline, and future fracture risk have not been explored in people with low, uh, in low risk individuals. So from a disease prevention perspective, we need to identify this relationship because they will be useful in guiding the timing and the use of prophylactic therapies to delay the progression of these two diseases in our aging population. So using data collected from our uh, current two-year um, respiratory for healthy aging in women study, so this is a two-year RCT with uh, outcomes on cognition, vascular function, body composition, and well-being. At baseline, we assess their systemic and cerebral uh, circulation. We have data uh, of their bone health uh, that's used to calculate the frax, percentage frax. Um, and also, they underwent a battery of cognitive tests that assess the following cognitive domains. So our, our women are about 65 years old, fairly high educated, uh, slightly overweight, but normal tensive. Um, and none of them were smokers or have significant um, heart con health conditions or on hormone therapy. And their bone health T-score of minus 1.1 puts them slightly osteopenic with a 5% um, uh, risk, uh, fracture risk. So here's just the distribution of their uh, T-scores and 50% of the cohort were considered to have normal bone density. 
And what we found was as bone health deteriorates, so does uh, their systemic large and small artery elasticity. And in fact, the large artery elasticity was associated with increased osteoporotic fracture risk. So among the various cognitive domains being tested here, cerebral arterial stiffness was significantly uh, correlated with poor processing speed, as well as um, poor vasodilatation in the brain was linked to poor verbal memory. And cerebral vessel stiffness increases, is correlated with um, osteoporotic and hip fracture risk. And those with higher risk of osteoporotic fracture also have poorer processing speed, cognitive flexibility, attention, and working memory. So to summarize, our findings provide a snapshot of the significant links between arterial stiffness and bone, low bone mineral density. And we have now shown for the first time these relationships in low risk individuals Poor cerebral vascular function is also linked to osteoporotic fracture risk. And cognitive domains related to increased fracture risk are poor processing speed, impairment in cognitive flexibility, poor attention, and working memory. And all of the, them have important implications for force-related fracture as they are involved in, involved in coordinating, coordinating our posture, our stability, as well as movement. So regardless of one's health status, um, we need to be able, you mean to try to encourage, you know, healthy diet and regular strength and aerobic conditionings for optimal vascular functioning. Um, and this, this is on top of our current recommendation for calcium and vitamin D intake. So I'd like to acknowledge my team at the University of Newcastle. Uh, and Newcastle is about two hours north of Sydney. And here's just an aerial shot of our local beach. Thank you. Thank you.